Hi everyone. Welcome to my talk on lumbar spine adaptation in cricket fast bowlers and risk factors to lumbar stress injury, part of the science in cricket series. I'm Dr. Pete Alway, research associate at the University of Suffolk, and I've been researching with the England and Wales cricket boards over the last five years. Today, we're going to explore how bone adapts to physical activity what the specific adaptations of bone are in, in cricket fast bowlers and also explore some of their risk factors to lumbar brain stress injuries. If you've got any questions or comments, please feel free to drop them down below or if you want to also message me on Twitter. So bone itself, the main aim of bone is to provide protection from fracture and how bone does this is it tries to optimise bone mass but also doing this in the most minimal way possible so it doesn't incur a large metabolic cost on the body. Basically, it doesn't need much much energy to function. Bone itself is comprised of, comprised of mainly inorganic material uh, and its main mechanical function is to provide rigid levers for muscle to put against, which allows us to move, which is pretty important. The macrostructure of bone is typically like this, where there's a cortical shell with a trabecular filling. The cortical bone itself is really dense, really brittle, um, really, really hard, whereas trabecular bone is quite soft, it's spongy, it's not very dense, but the rods and struts of this type of bone can orient themselves uh, in any direction against the typical loading patterns. If we zoom in further into the microstructure, what we find in the cortical bone is it's full of these uh, cylindrical osteans which contain bone cells and also the uh, blood vessels themselves which can um, deliver and take away minerals which is really important in understanding how bone adapts to physical activity. If we look at the bone cells themselves the most important one arguably is the osteocytes which make up 85 to 95 percent of all the cells in in bone so all those little black dots we can see there those are osteocytes and their main function is thought to be the ability to sense uh, mechanical strain imposed on it typically this may come from physical activity and it can also communicate with other osteocytes and also with um, other cells in in the body one of these cells is osteoclasts and the role of osteoclasts is to uh, remove damaged or disused bone. And another bone cell is osteoplasts whose role is to deposit bone. Typically an osteocyte will be stimulated either by heightened loading, damage or, or lower loading, which will all cause different physiological uh, responses. So bone itself will respond to its uh, mechanical em em environment to improve its um, resistance to fracture and it does this through modelling and remodelling processes which we'll get come to shortly. We know that the adaptation of bone to physical activity is really really site specific so if we look at tennis players for example the research shows that the dominant playing arm of players so the right arm in a right in a right-handed player has much greater bone mode density content and structural properties than the non-dominant arm likely due to the increased load being put on that arm compared with the non-playing arm we also know that these adaptations are stimulated by a really short number of loading cycles so you get most physiological adaptation from the first 50 load cycles in a particular bout of exercise, which is demonstrated when you compare weightlifters who have really, really, really strong and big bones compared with marathon runners. Weightlifters are doing very small number of cycles in their activity, whereas marathon runners with their uh, lower bone density and smaller bones are doing tens of thousands of cycles and they have very different um, responses in there. Following about of loading or after around 50 load cycles, the bone cells will desensitize for about six to eight hours, allowing no further adaptation to take place. How does this adaptation happen? So we know that osteocytes can be, be 
electrically stimulated and from this they can cause four pathways to happen. Two of these occur in an increased strain stimulus environment on the right through formation modeling or targeted remodeling. This acts to try to increase the um, resilience of bone, increase the strength, whereas in a de decreased strain stimulus in environment we get resorption modeling and this use mediated remodeling and this acts to decrease the strength of bone but to also improve the metabolic cost of bone. So I'm going to take you through this diagram here just to show how these four things the, these four pathways work. So firstly at the top we've got formation modeling. So in this situation we're in a mechanical um, environment where there's heighted loading this heightened loading perturbs the osteocytes who send out signals that they need greater bone to be um, to be deposited. Because of this signal, osteoblasts come to the site of greatest loading and they deposit bone down, which over time beca becomes mineralized and increases bone strength, therefore increases resilience to fracture. In a similar scenario, we have heightened loading and in this targeted remodeling case what happens here is that the loading is is so great that our osteocytes actually die so there there are micro cracks in the bone and these go through the osteocytes themselves the at, at death these osteocytes will I release a signal that there is damaged bone in this area and this damaged bone is unresolved is resorbed by osteoclasts causing temporary um, resorption of bone but also there are then signals put out for osteoblasts to come and fill in the the hole caused by the um, resorption because of this we end up with uh, greater greater mineralization and often greater bone strength properties than than previously then we move on to our disuse pathways. So firstly we have disuse mediated remodeling where uh, and it in this situation where bone isn't be isn't being stimulated, again osteocytes die, again osteoclasts take bone away, but this time the osteoblastic um, response isn't as great as in the targeted remodeling case. This results in less less mineralization and ultimately weaker bones. Finally, at the bottom, we have resorption modeling. And again, we go through uh, this uh, disuse induced osteocyte death. And in this case, only osteoclasts are uh, signaled for. We get this de decrease in mass and there are, there's no osteoblastic activity here um, resulting in decreased bone strength. And we can see this happening in, in baseball pictures. So this is a cross section taken through the um, humerus of the uh, dominant throwing arm versus the non-dominant throwing arm and as well compared with a typical active person. And we can see that there is significantly more bone mass and just sheer size in the throwing arm of the, of the picture. So this is how uh, bone works uh, typically, a really, really site specific response. So now on to fast bowling. So firstly, it's probably important to talk about what fast bowling is. So fast bowling is typically characterized by two different things. The first is at front foot contact. We have this huge gra ground reaction force. So at this point, we see typically between four to 11 times body weights going through the body. This is coupled with a opposing side flexion and rotation moments following front foot contact in the trunk itself. So as we see here, we see the side flexion moving away from the bowling arm while the rotation moves towards the, the bowling arm in the trunk. You might be wondering why are people using this weird action? Why don't they just throw it like they do in baseball? Well, one of the rules in cricket is that you're not allowed to extend your elbow more than 15 degrees, basically not allowing throwing. Therefore, to bowl fast, it's important that people run in quite fast and then they do this, what might seem like a weird action in order to 
deliver the ball at speeds in excess of 150 kilometers an hour. So how much do fast bowlers do this weird high loading action? So this is a typical international cricketer and this is that their match volumes taken across their career. So in this near 18 year career, see that this bowler in matches alone has bowled nearly 60,000 deliveries. So therefore, if we were to include tra training training overs and balls into this too, we'd probably be looking at 100,000 um, deliveries, which is a lot for something which is so high loading. This compares favorably with our cousins in in baseball uh, to throw slightly more pitches in in matches per year but not by very much so similar volumes between the two activities so from this it got us wondering how does the lumbar spine um, respond to fast bowling given that there is a massive ground reaction force and then you've got this opposing uh, forces being put on the spine during the actual um, delivery itself so what we looked at for this is we compared a group of fast bowlers with our batters, with a group of rugby players and a group of uh, physically active controls. We chose the batters because their training volume is going to be similar to the bowlers. And we chose the rugby players because the forces in, in rugby are really, really bilateral. So it should be very different to what we see in the asymmetric fast bowling technique. And what we found in our elite men is that we found that the uh, fast bowlers have high bone bone wear density in their uh, lumbar spine, much greater than the controls and nearly significantly greater than the batters and the rugby players. And we found a mean Z score in our fast bowlers of about of about 2.5, which means that they're two and a half standard deviations above what is normal for their age and their race. So, OK, we've got some really strong bones here. But then we decided to take it one step further. We started noticing that the patterns of, of bone was greater on one side than the other. And what we found is that the bone mode density on the non-dominant or the contralateral side uh, uh, compared to the bowling arm was much greater than on the ipsilateral side or the um, dominant side. So this buildup of bone seemed to increase as well as we move down from L1 to L4, where at L4 we have around 25 to 30% greater bone mode density on that non-dominant side, which in a right-handed bowler is on the left-hand side. So we have this really, really unique adaptation. So our next question was, well, do we see this in our, our female cohort too? And we know that our female fast bowlers bowl at a slower speed and their match volumes are also, also loads, loads less. So we're really interested to see if this adaptation persisted regardless of sex. Also, in the women's game, there's a much greater prevalence of, 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 of spin bowlers, which allowed us to independently compare spin bowlers with fast bowlers. And again, we also were interested in how our, our batters compared. As well as this, we used footballers for this comparison, again, because of the bilateral characteristics. What we found in this is that between groups, there were no differences. So your batters, fast bowlers, spin bowlers, and footballers, all of them had high bone mineral density. So all adapted to their activities. But again, what we found when we looked closer was a similar pattern to the men we found that there was greater bone mineral density on the contralateral side of the spine. So the opposite side to the bowling arm, we found that there was much greater density and this increased from L1 to L4. What was also interesting in this was the spin bowlers also had the same pattern, albeit just at L4. So from this information from in the elite males and females, what we've come to find out is that we have this this unique adaptation to bowling not just fast bowling but but spin bowling too which is independent of sex or bowling type so anyone who bowls likely has the same uh, unique adaptation which to date hasn't been seen in any other sport so basically fast bowlers have some 
really weird, interesting adaptations going on. But this only made us want to think further about this. So our next question was trying to understand, well, how does this adaptation change with age? So to do this, we took our elite cohort of players through from academy level through to the elite level. So 14 to, to 24 year olds. And we wanted to compare them with high performance field sport controls from you know, uh, football, hockey, etc., to try to understand exactly when this awesome adaptation is occurring. And for this, we took scans at the end of the um, respective seasons in all the sports across a number of times. until so I think we had around nearly 300 measurements uh, in these in these players and what we found in this is that at age 14 across the whole number spine there's really not that much difference at age 14 and it's only really in in late adolescence that we start to see this large difference between the fast bowlers and our field sport controls particularly from the ages of at 14 to 18, we have this rapid acceleration in accrual of bone mode density that's likely due to the large forces imposed on the lumbar spine during cricket bowling compared to those in field sports. We notice in our fast bowlers that this seems to plateau at around age, age 22, so prior to what has been published in the research for typical adaptation in uh, uh, healthy humans. So we have this rapid accelerated adaptation. Of the whole lumbar spine. Interestingly, when we looked at the site specific adaptation, what we found on the ipsilateral side, the same side as the bowling arm, is that there's no difference in the um, adaptation patterns between fast bowlers and, and, and field sport controls. They are the same. They follow the same pattern and they reach the same peak values. However, on the contralateral side, the opposite side to the bowling arm, what we see is the large, large differences. E even at age 14, we almost see that there's greater, greater density on, on this contralateral side. And this increases far and beyond the field sport controls. So this adaptation is near localized to, to the contralateral side of the spine. When we were looking at the asymmetry as well, what we find is that even our 14 year olds are asymmetric. So this asymmetric adaptation is already present in um, in 14 year olds. And this almost linearly increases um, up until age 24, where it likely continues further and uh, throughout the career of a fast bowler. So at age 24, we typically have around 25% greater bone mode density on the contractual side of, of L4. So this again made us think, well, what actually drives this adaptation? So what we did for this is we used our database from DEXA and we combined it with our database from the from biomechanics. And what we found drives this adaptation is Fat-free mass, so unsurprisingly, muscle seems to be the primary driver of um, bone adaptation in, in our fast bowlers. And then we find a combination of contralateral um, thoracic spine rotation with less ipsilateral uh, lumbar pelvic rotation coupled with greater contractile pelvic drop. These three factors likely interact together to put a huge torsional load on the spine, which then drives the high asymmetric and adaptation seen in fast bowlers. Interestingly, despite being up to 11 times an individual's body weight, we found that there was no significant, no significant contribution from ground reaction forces, which suggests that muscle forces alone likely put the greatest strain upon the, the lumbar spine and they really drive this unique adaptation. Our next question was everyone, well, is this asymmetric adaptation something which is permanent and to do this we took two groups we took one group of players who were undergoing rehab following stress fracture and then a group of players who weren't injured and we followed them on four different occasions in the um, subsequent year and this is what we found so you see the uninjured players at the top there we've just had a general increase in their bone density at 
at their whole number spine. Whereas our uninjured players, we see this drastic drop in bone, which lasts for around six months post-injury and doesn't reach baseline until between sort of nine to 12 months afterwards. This drop of three to 4% of bone in five to six months is basically what astronauts experience when they go to the space station. It's a, a unremarkably quick decrease in bone. And interestingly, when we impose what the players are doing at this time of their rehab, it starts to paint a picture. So, of course, when there's rest, we know that if bones aren't, aren't stimulated, they lose bone density. So that was expected. But what we didn't expect so much is that during their SNC phase of, of their rehab, these players continued to lose bone mineral density, they continue to lose the strength of their bone, which suggests that strength exercises alone are not enough to replicate the strains put on the lumbar spine during fast bowling. It's only when players return to bowl and with such um, sufficient volume and intensity does, bone mineral density, does the bone mineral density start to uh, reverse and increase in, it, in its density and, uh, and also mass, and particularly when they um, uh, return to play so they're really getting the volume and intensities up that we see these um, this return of, of density you can also use this to understand more about why um, recurrences of uh, lumbar process injuries ha happen happen so much you see like players coming back after six to seven months their bones are uh, going to be so much weaker and their tolerance to fast bowling is going to be a lot less make them quite susceptible to injury we also note that this decrease and increase in density occurs basically across all sites that we see, but greater on the contralateral, more adapted site. So it, we almost have this use it or lose it mentality to bone adaptation. And it means that it means that you need to take care of your fast bowlers um, during rehab and particularly um, return to bowling and play. But it also means that at the end, end of the season, it may not be wise to give players a significant break from bowling. You know, we see these large deficits within a month to six weeks of bowling. So perhaps, you know, this is uh, this may provide evidence of of the need to not have such long breaks at the end of the season. So to conclude this part, cricket fast bowling is a high lumber loading, high workload activity. We've seen that fast bowlers have this unique site-specific adaptation to their activity with a really high bone mineral density, which is driven by this asymmetric response. This adaptation is already present at uh, 14 years and it increases with, um, with chronological age. And we know that this adaptation isn't permanent. So into the, the second part of this presentation where we're going to go through some of the risk factors to lumbar bone stress injuries. So firstly, we need to understand what are lumbar bone stress injuries. So lumbar bone stress injuries are caused by an imbalance between micro damage and the uh, repair processes of bone. This is what micro damage looks like. You see this white line here basically working its way through bone. And what micro damage does is it, it decreases the structural properties of bone. So it decreases the, the ultimate strength, the stiffness, and the amount of work of the failure. Basically, micro damage makes bone more prone to injury. Typically, we can image these using CT or MRI. So you can see here on the right-hand side of the image, we can see a, a clear fracture line through the bone. And these typically occur at the pars or, or the pedicle in cricket fast bowlers. So what are lumbar bone stress injuries? Well, they're on a continuum, something where there's no bone stress before there's an accumulation of, of micro damage. This leads into a, a stress reaction, an incomplete unilateral stress fracture, a complete unilateral stress fracture before we get to the multi-level bilateral, bilateral stress fractures. Symptoms seem to increase with the um, severity of the, of, of the injury. As, as does time loss. So a, a stress reaction, you may be looking at like six to 10 weeks off, also known as a hotspot, whereas your incomplete, um, your incomplete stress fractures, you're looking at you know four to six months, and then you, 
you're complete and you're multi-level, you're looking at you know, at least a season, if, if not more, and and possibly surgery if, if the fracture site remains unstable. From our research where we looked at, across seven years of, of data, we found 57 stress fractures in our, our, our professional game. And what we found is that most of them happen at L4 at, and L5, so about a third of a third at each of these, uh, which differs to other sports with high rates of, of, of lumbar brain stress injuries. Um, in other sports which which have high incidence of these, such as gymnastics or American football or, or platform diving, almost all these injuries are seen at, at L5, which shows that cricket may have a unique etiology of, of injury. We found that 93% of them were on the non-dominant side, so on the contractual side. So as you heard earlier, this site is the most adapted. So it suggests that this site is under, under great load and can fracture. The amount of time loss which you see per stress fracture is long, is eight months on average. And collectively, it costs three to 4,000 days per season to the game and across a career, 67% of all bowlers will have some sort of um, of, of lumbar brain stress injury. Our typical age of stress fracture is is quite young. It's usually in our 18 to 22 year olds and typically in players who are stepping up a level. So if they're going from academy cricket to second team cricket or second team cricket to first team cricket and occasionally first team cricket to international cricket is generally when we see players get stress fractures. So younger fast bowlers are generally more at risk of, of getting stress fractures. So you know that the lumbar spine in cricket is the the, the most prevalent site of injury. It, it, it causes the greatest time loss and that is typically driven by lumbar stress fractures. So despite being quite a low incidence injury, the massive time loss makes it extremely prevalent and it's of great cost cost to the game. So it's really important that we understand more about the risk that the risk factors associated with this injury so we can try to stop them happening. So to explore why risk factors happen or what the risk factors are to 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 lumbar process injury, we need to go through how bone adapts again. So we know that there's a given lumbar lows and this interacts with the stiffness properties of bone and these collectively place a strain within the bone which is what our bone cells the osteocytes can detect so we know that there's this bone cell and activity going on we also know that bone strains themselves can cause micro damage and we know that micro damage negatively affects the stiffness of bone and the structural properties. Of course, when you have impaired bone stiffness, when you have this interaction with the same lumbar load, it means that for the same lumbar load, the bone strain is going to be higher, which in turn is going to cause more micro damage. So there's almost this negative feedback effect of decreasing bone strength properties, causing increases bone strain. And this cycle will continue until there's eventually the bone stress injury manifestation. However, in optimal conditions, optimal bone cell activity can occur, which facilitates positive bone adaptation, which enhance, which will enhance the stiffness of bone, resulting in a comparatively lower bone strain, and therefore less, less likely that micro damage will accumulate. Micro damage isn't all bad though, as we know that with enough rest, we know that this micro damage can actually actually stimulate positive bone adaptation for its interaction with bone cell activity, activity to again improve bone stiffness. To understand the risk factors further, we have to look at what, what actually contributes to each of these factors independently. So for lumbar lows, we know that this is influenced by the technical characteristics a person uh, possesses. So what technique do they bowl with? the muscle properties, so not just the cross-sectional area, but also you know, how what's their rate of force development like, you know, how powerful are they? And also the anatomy of, of the fast bowler. So an, an example of this is that players who have uh, a more lordotic lumbar spine likely put greater load 
on their lumbar spine. The factors which affect bone stiffness are typically the things which we can't change. So things like um, career bowling volume, we can't affect how much someone's bowled in their life. Same with um, genetics, uh, uh, nutritional history and previous uh, physical activity. These are all things which we can't change. And we generally see better bone stiffness in those who have a varied, uh, a varied sport childhood basically so playing loads of different sports seems to have much better bone outcomes than those who just focus on a single sports we also know from our work in our injured players that an a bout of extended bowling rest has a negative effect on bone stiffness so if we look into enhanced bone stiffness properties having a big break from from bowling isn't the best idea there's also a number of factors which we can change that affect uh, bone cell activity. So to optimize the activity of our osteoblasts and osteoclasts, what we want is, is we want our nutrition to be really good. So making sure we have enough energy to fuel these activities. A lot of the adaptations that we see in bone occurs when we're asleep. Therefore, sleep quality is really, really important. The use of painkillers can negatively affect bone cell activity, particularly if taken before physical activity. And then we have our, our female specific um, variables. So those with impaired menstrual status uh, may have negative uh, uh, bone cell activity, which affects the ability of bone to, to adapt. And the same with um, some contraceptives. I think more research is needed in this area to understand more about the role of different contraceptives on, on bone cell activity. And then we also know that micro damage is likely caused by short term workloads. So how can we prevent lumbar bone cell injuries? So we have two options based on what we know. We can decrease the amount of lumbar load or we can enhance the stiffness of, of the lumbar spine. Both of these have the same effects. They will decrease the bone strain, which is being put in the bone. By doing this, we can decrease the amount of, of micro damage accumulation, and therefore we can increase the capacity an individual has until they can suffer a lumbar bone stress injury. So the first thing which we want to look at from this was match bowling volume and what we did was we looked at a seven year period of first and second 11 county cricket and we looked at every scorecard of these games collectively and what we did in this is we took 57 players who who got stress fractures and then we matched them with 57 players who didn't get stress fractures in this time period and we matched them for age bowling hands and um and career workloads. So, so we try to match them as well as possible. We looked at their peak workload in a season as well as their workloads at injury. So we're looking to see if is there a relationship, a relationship at, at any point in the season where there's a big spike in workload or is it purely um, related to the injury itself? And this is what we found. So we found that at injury, we found that seven day, 28 day and 90 day workloads. The fast bowlers who got injured had significantly greater bowling volumes than those who, who didn't get injured. We also found this as well when we looked at peak workloads in both in seven day, 28 day and 90 day workloads. And when we ran this data through a um, regression to find the best predictor of um, lumbar bone stress injury, what we found is that the bowlers who bowled more than 234 balls in any seven day period in that season tripled their risk of getting lumbar, lumbar stress fracture compared to those who bowled less than 210 balls. So this spike in, in workload at any point in, in the season seems to massively increase the risk of an individual getting a um, lumbar stress fracture. And this is um, regardless of age. And we dug further into this data to look at age age specific thresholds for what we think will foster the best bone adaptation possible without taking players into 
a zone where they're likely to get injured. So we've um, released these guidelines to all of our uh, uh, professional teams in England. Mm. What we are also also curious about as well was that there was this delay between the spike in workloads and the injury actually manifesting. So there's typically a three to six week delay between a spike in workload and the injury actually manifesting, which maybe gives us a window of opportunities for working to prevent the injury from happening. So to do this, we were also curious about this group of players who didn't get injured despite having really, really high peak seven day workloads. And when we looked at our injured players who bowled more than 234 balls compared to those who bowled more than 234 balls, what we found is that their their workloads, that their bowling volumes didn't really differ. So they spent as much time above above 234 balls as the um, injured players. The average balls they bowled after their spike in workload was also the same. But what differed was our rest values. So within three weeks of the, the spike in workload, our uninjured players embarked in a much longer rest than those who uh, didn't, those who did get injured. So uninjured players, they typically would rest, they'd have a, a, an unbroken rest of up to of around 15 days compared to cases who whose longest rest was around 10 days. And this started um, in, in that three week period. We also note that the bowling volume is a lot less in those players who don't get injured in the two weeks following a spike in workload. So it seems that a reduced bowling volume and a sustained period of rest following a spike in workload may improve the damage structural properties of bone and can um, prevent stress fractures. This has to occur in this first three to three to six weeks following a spike in workload. We've included this in our uh, recommendations to coaches to try to get this rest and decreased volume in. We also know that fast bowling technique likely has an effect on stress fracture. So to this, we'll just have a quick recap on what fast bowling is. So typically fast bowlers will run in before bounding into a jump and gather. So before back foot contact, front foot contact, ball release and the follow through. While the rules of Fast bowling say that, that fast bowlers cannot extend their elbow uh, by more than 15 degrees during the um, delivery stride. This also permits a lot of different techniques to um, survive in cricket. Those who know cricket will see people who like to sling the ball down, sort of a very round arm action, and those who like to be really upright when they bowl. And it's this, it's this possibility to have many different techniques to have the same outcome which is one of the reasons why fast bowling is so exciting. So the goal of this study here was to look at our historical database of MRI based lumbar bone stress injuries and compare it with our biomechanics database. And what we had for this was at the start, we had 50 fast bowlers with no known history of lumbar bone stress injury. And 39 of these went on to get lumbar bone stress injuries within two years of of their biomechanical testing. It, only 11 players did not um, sustain uh, lumbar bone stress injury in this period and also had 150 match days of unprofessional um, cricket under their belts, suggesting that they probably survived the high risk region for lumbar stress fractures. And we want you to compare that uh, techniques between the uh, two groups. So. What we found is at back foot contact, there was a number of differences between groups with our injured players having greater rear knee flexion, greater rear hip flexion, and also greater contralateral thoracic spine rotation, but also greater uh, thoracic spine ipsilateral side flexion than our un uninjured players. So it's starting to realize that back foot contact is quite important for injury. We also found differences between groups at front foot contact. So we found 
greater hip flexion at front foot contact in our injured players, a more anteriorly tilted pelvis at front foot contact, greater lumbar pelvic extension at front foot contact. And finally, at ball release, what we find is that our injured players, they actually have less thoracic side flexion than the uninjured players. And while side flexion has long been looked at as a risk factor to uh, lumbar stress fracture, I think what this shows is it's important where the side flexion comes from. So if the side flexion comes from the lumbar spine, that, that's slightly more risky than if the side flexion comes from the thoracic spine. As, as we know, a degree of side flexion is needed to get the arm in the right, right position to, to deliver the ball. So we found a number of, of biomechanical factors that differed between injured and uninjured players. And when we put this through a um, regression, we found that two factors predicted 88% of um, lumbar brain stress injuries. So we found hip flexion and, and lumbar pelvic extension were the two biggest risk factors with greater rear hip flexion being, uh, being associated we have lumbar brain stress injuries as well as greater lumbar pelvic extension at, at front foot contact. We also looked at mixed actions, but none of the characteristics of mixed actions were associated with injury in this cohort. Next, we're also curious about our bone marrow density values um, and how these um, laid in players who did and didn't have um, lumbar brain stress injuries. So cross-sectionally at injury, what we found is that our injured group had uh, a lower bone density across the whole L1 to L4 lumbar spine, but also on the contralateral side of L3 and, and L4. So we find that in the sites which we expect there to be the greatest adaptation, we find in our injured players that this, this adaptation hasn't occurred. And now the challenge is trying to understand why hasn't this, this adaptation occurred? Is it a consequence of their bowling action or do they have a uh, a nutritional deficit etc like are they getting enough vitamin d etc there's a number of reasons to why their bone marrow density may be lower finally we know that younger players are more susceptible to uh, to to lumbar bone stress injuries and one of the reasons for this may be because they lack the skeletal um, resilience to to with understand the demands of um, professional cricket. When we impose the value of the injured player's BMD over the top of our hot, um, age versus BMD graph, what we find is that it doesn't really interact until around age 20. And it may be that those who have less bowling volume are going to be under this line for a sig sig significant proportion of their lives. Basically, young players lack the um, resilience needed. So. To summarise, lumbar brain stress injuries are multifactorial. Factorial. Seven day spikes in, in workload likely increase the risk of uh, lumbar brain stress injuries. Rest is probably your best friend following any spike in workload and may prevent uh, lumbar brain stress injuries. The technique factors are the best predictors of any risk factor of future lumbar brain stress injuries in fast bowlers. And you should always be aware that young fast bowlers are unlikely to have the skeletal resilience to um, resist the demands of, of, of professional cricket. So please be careful with your young cricketers and uh, develop them carefully so their careers can flourish. Thank you so much for listening. As I said in my intro, drop me a message on Twitter or in the comments down below if you have any comments or, or questions. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.